We want to engage in a discussion today. So Rawe, I'm going to start with you. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Great. So what are the ways through which youth believe they could engage in climate change or to address climate vulnerabilities of Africa? You have diverse experience. You are a climate negotiator. You have been working with UN agencies like UNICEF. So if you can briefly explain that to us and uh, as we are mapping a way forward in the end route to COP27. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So as you said, Elizabeth, it all started with my name. So I'm also the daughter of a farmer and we're facing the impact of climate change basically each day and every day. The impact is so visible and palpable and so it really breaks my heart to see our farm turn into mere wasteland because of drought and water scarcity. Um, and so this motivates me to be involved in a number of NGOs, so namely Dynamique Autour de l'eau, then Réseau Enfant de la Terre, and uh, currently also a uh, youth uh, technical cohort of the UNICEF. Uh, we work on, on empowerment women leadership um, for climate uh, change. Uh, so, and after all this, I've been selected uh, to be a member of the young negotiators on climate change in the Tunisian delegation. So here I'm going to seize this opportunity to tell you a bit more about this experience. Uh, so basically, uh, we are a group of young uh, people. We've been selected to support the Tunisian delegation in COPS. And uh, actually, uh, we are like uh, eight women, uh, 11 women and seven men. So here, it was not that easy. I mean, the procedure was, was a bit difficult, but at least we managed to, to take a step forward. So we have like two approaches. We have uh, like a bottom-up approach because we've been uh, advocating for youth implication in the decision-making process, and also a top-down approach that is the government, the Ministry of Environment, has provided an, in, an enabling environment so that we can be part of the Tunisian delegation in the uh, climate negotiations. Uh, so basically here what I'm trying to say is that it is really important. I mean, you mentioned vulnerability. True, young people, women and girls especially, we are vulnerable. But I'd rather say we are like systematically marginalized. And the point here that I'm trying to make is how really to shift from this vulnerability to leadership and resilience. So that is the point. And um, so basically, if we like see here and there, what I have to say. Thank you so much and congratulations for all the amazing work you are doing. And also a round of applause to the organizers of the event because there is gender balance here. So we just want to say thank you for that. Teddy, I would like to ask you, based on the Rwandan example, could you reflect the role of the government leadership to enable or rather create conducive environment for young people to transform or transition to a more resilient, inclusive, sustainable climate future for Africa. Thank you, all the buzzwords. Huh? <laughs> so first of all, I'd like to thank UNDP for the invitation to participate uh, on this panel. I believe climate action is a pressing issue and, uh, and really to, to come to or address the points, you, sorry, address the question you just asked. Uh, I think addressing the climate issue requires three things. So I'll expand this uh, based on three points. First collective collaboration and obviously with a strong focus on youth. Second point is if we're going to address climate change, there's a need for innovation. Again, youth is very important in this area. And the third is we need finance. Now, um, 
what we've done on the side of the government of Rwanda. So the government of Rwanda has set an ambitious uh, climate change um, you know, sort of targets. Um, so looking at our vision 2050, we want to be a carbon neutral economy by the year 2050. Um, we have uh, set an ambitious target under the Paris Agreement. We need to reduce our emissions by 38% by the year 2030. This is going to require um, 11 billion. Now, coming down to how do we ensure that, um, you know, obviously the youth is part of this. So um, the government has put in place an enabling environment that is all inclusive and really involves the youth. So just to give you an example, uh, we have a, a, a group of uh, climate activists. Uh, they go by the name of um, um, Green Protectors. So we, we constantly have discussions with them. When we go to COP, they're part of the negotiations, they're, they're negotiators. Um, you know, when we're having discussions around finance, they're part of the discussion. And now to bring it down a little bit, focusing on the innovation and the finance bit, uh, maybe to elaborate more what we're doing uh, at the fund. So the Rwanda Green Fund was established to really uh, support the government of Rwanda to mobilize the finance needed to achieve these targets. Because again, if we're talking about addressing climate change and we don't have the right instruments in place to attract the money to, you know, to address the issues that my colleague was just talking about, it wouldn't make sense. So particularly for the, for the youth, uh, we're working on establishing a green incubator and accelerator program. Um, because what we've seen, partic particularly in our market, which is, I believe, similar to other parts of you know, the region in Africa, we have a, a, a young private sector. Um, you, know, you have these young entrepreneurs, youth, um, that, that are still at the startup phase. So it's important that when we're even mobilizing money, we need to put up the right instruments to support them. So through incubation, um, sometimes you find that someone has a great idea, but they need de business development support. Um, some might need a small grant to get them started to do some piloting or feasibility study. So that's what I would say in a nutshell, the government of Rwanda is doing is one, to put an enabling environment, involve the youth um, through the climate activists uh, that are in, in place, and third, providing uh, financial instruments that can help them uh, be part of the equation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tadi. And I, I also like the fact that you highlighted the point on collaboration, innovation, and also climate finance. And now coming to you, uh, Jeveline, I mean, Teddy mentioned about climate finance. As a young entrepreneur, uh, who is also the former winner of Youth Connect, right? What do you think is hindering young African entrepreneurs to transition to green businesses? Okay, thank you for that question, Liz. Um, so I know uh, once a while we have asked this question, what kind of business can I do that will bring in cash, will bring in money? But people hardly ask, let me say like less than 10% always ask the question like, what kind of problem have I identified in climate that I can provide a solution? So in uh, October 2019, while we were here during the Youth Connect Africa Summit, many young entrepreneurs were networking and asking questions like, what kind of business can I start that is going to bring me cash and money? But then there was one uh, young entrepreneur, Lawrence, I remember, he said something that actually changed my mindset. He said something that it's what has caused me to be where I am today. He said, in three to five years, if young African entrepreneurs don't transition to climate change businesses, Africa is going to sink. And of course, a few months later, you, we hear about the flooding in, in Nigeria, in Cameroon, in Central Africa, probably Chad and South Sudan that is killing and displacing people. Now, secondly, I'm going to talk about the passion. Many young entrepreneurs don't have the passion for solving the problem. Okay, we are coming here for the Youth Connect Africa Summit, and we have been having breakfast, we have been having lunch and supper. Now, what, what, who can tell me that the, the quantity of tons of food that we have actually thrown in the trash? And we are climate activists. So if that passion is not there, you will not see entrepreneurs transitioning into climate change. And I want to give a quote by Kerwin Ray. He says, young entrepreneurs don't chase after money. Chase after solving the problem, and money will follow you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juvenil. Thank you so much. Pat Ranking. 
I'm sure everyone is wondering why you are here. They need to know that you have a special message that you're carrying. So based on, on your life experience, it will be good to understand if you have any advice to young people in Africa on how climate change can be an opportunity to them and transform Africa. Also, I think whilst you're also answering that question, maybe you can also expand to let us know how the art space or the industry can also be used as an advocacy tool to advocate for climate change. Sorry, can I use your mic? Um, you know, we're used to this kind of mic, so. Um, I want to say good morning, everyone. My name is Pat Rankin. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity, this platform to, you know, tell you things that I know about life. You know, when you look at me, it's not just music. I, I want you to see a young man that best explain what surviving any of um, harsh conditions or climate conditions, you know, what it looks like, you know. Um, I'm from a slum in Lagos, in a place called um, Ilaje Ibutemeta, and um, you know what an average slum looks like. It, it, um, it is what it is over there. And we've, we've had several situations that can only be explained if you live there. You know, there are some things that would happen. You can't, they can't explain it to you. You just have to experience it. And I experienced it firsthand. You know, that's why I, I, my team and I were quite excited to speak about it on this platform, you know. I, I think it's very important we, we, we make people understand, you know, what, how important climate change means to us. Um, first, I will start by saying awareness. A lot of people are not aware. You know, I'm coming from a place where you have to you have to tell us a zillion times to get the first letter, you know? So if you're saying change, 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 you have to, it, take, it might take us like 20 years to understand what C means before you get to H, A, you know, N and so on. So it's very important we, we, we educate, you know, people, which is why I'm here, which is what I'm doing because um, where I come from, most people might see me as just, Oh, he's a musician, he makes music, you know, but I think he's much more more than that. This is why I want to use my platform to advise people, to talk to people, you know, and um, also support people, you know. Um, the youth, we have it in our hands right now. For example, the election coming up in Nigeria, 70% of the people that will be making the decisions are youth, you know, th which is why the Youth Connect is very important. So if I'm here, we need to champion more like awareness program, like people need to understand, they need to know that such platforms are important. So if Arthur Rankin would like to use his own platform to tell the world or tell most of the communities, the slums, about the importance of what climate, what it can, how it can be of, how it's been bad to us, provide solution, you know, and talk about solutions like that. I think more people need to be involved as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm sure. You One more thing. We have to be intentional about this, please. Thank you so much. I'm sure you have heard it for yourselves how the platform can be used to advocate for change. Michele Candotti. As a representative of a UN agency, it would be good to understand how can Africa, the youngest continent, lead on a just transition in a more resilient, inclusive, and sustainable way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. 
and I feel, I feel, I have a double feeling today because I'm the oldest in this panel. I could be your grandfather or father, so apologies if I, I, if I may sound lecturing you, I'm not. But at this, thank you. Is it better that, yeah. So many thanks for allowing me to be here. It's an incredible opportunity. As I said, I could be your grandfather or father. I'm not lecturing you. I will be giving you some points of reflection. An organization of the UN may sound as abstract as a concept as it could be climate change as an environmental issue. It always happens somewhere else. It doesn't touch your daily life. It doesn't impact your daily routine. And yet, we can help you make a difference. How? First of all, by creating those bridges between real life and science, real life and discoveries and evidence of the increasing negative effects of climate change. We bring knowledge and, and universal knowledge to your doorstep so that you can use it, you can package it, you can turn it into a movement, passion, decision making. That's the first thing we can do. The second thing is to connect you with the decision makers. We are heading towards a COP, which is the conference of the parties that are deciding on the next deals related to climate change mitigation and adaptation. But how can youth, which is basically the future, the present and the future, impact those decisions? In my opinion, it's about choices. The choices we make today may impact favorably the future of Africa, the future of Rwanda, but the future of the world, of each and every community, but also negatively. Whatever choice we make is not a choice about the environment as an abstract concept. It is choice, these are choices that impact daily lives. The farming communities, for instance, that suffer uh, crop losses, uh, they suffer from droughts, repeated droughts, all over the continent, but also beyond the continent boundaries. It's about choices between using your money, uh, the rare and very shy public money, to repair every year the damages provoked by increasing episodes of climate change or to invest them to create jobs, to create the future and to create development opportunities for youth. So it is about choices, it is about connecting you with decision makers, it is giving you the knowledge and the tools to be a critical mind in those decision making processes. This is what we can do what we can provide you with but it is a very tough ask because uh, the choices of decision makers of today are normally and many 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 times driven by self-preservation of the you know whoever is in power and we want to shake that tree and open their eyes so that we make the space for the future generations' decisions not to be locked in a 50-year cycle of decisions or bad decisions. So this is what we can offer to you. Knowledge, connectivity, motivation, and a little bit of support through opening your eyes and the opportunities to technology solutions, financing solutions, etc. You have incredible examples here in Rwanda already with our colleagues and be proud of it, you are an innovative forum that can give us hope for the future. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michele.
He says it's all about choices. There is need for knowledge, there is need for capacity building, there is need for support to young people so that they can also be part of the just transition in this young continent. We have also heard from Teddy, she was talking about the need for access to climate finance. She was also talking about the importance of innovation. We have heard it from Rawe, she was talking about the importance of making sure that young women are also part of decision making. We have heard it from, I mean, the former winner of Youth Connect last year, she was talking about the importance of making sure that in this crisis that we are facing, there are always opportunities that are there. Let's not only focus on the crisis, but let's also focus on the opportunities that are there so that we can upscale green businesses in our continent. So, I am going to open the floor just to take a few questions, just a few questions. I think maximum could be three. So can you please have the microphones ready? And um, I will randomly select people who are going to ask these questions, making sure there is a bit of some gender balance there, okay? So if you have a question, please raise up your hand. Okay, we'll start with the gentleman on my left. Yes, you. Good morning, everyone. Um, basically, I want to use this opportunity to say thank you to all the panelists. They've made amazing contribution. However, one of the questions that I would want to ask today is, um, for me, basically, I believe when you're not part of the solution, it means you're part of the problem. So how can we create a platform to understand the root cause of climate change in Africa and how is it affecting? Like, because a lot of us, the youth, yes, climate change is affecting us, but we don't know the root cause, and of course, we don't know, like, how it's affecting us and how it's going to affect us in the future. So how can we create platforms ensuring that by 2030, every youth is going to be aware and every youth will want to be a part of the solution, ensuring that we solve this problem of climate change. Because if Africa is expected to get the largest workforce by 2035, I believe we need to cater for climate change. And how can we create that platform so everybody feels comfortable to be among this solution and to be among this change that we all are seeking? Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there a lady at the back raising a hand? Okay, we have one here. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, my question is directed specifically at Pataranki, if that's okay. Um, I'd like him to tell us how exactly he intends to um, be part of the solution in terms of um, coming through with his platform, being a musician, um, having the access to other artists, having the access to platforms that a lot of people don't have access to, and how he intends to make that change, you know, starting from himself. Thank you. Thank you so much. One last question. Okay, do we have anyone from the upper row? Anyone? Okay, I can't see, but one question from, uh, huh. okay, you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Um, my name is Daura Cham, I am from the Gambia and I'm a climate um, change activist. I'm also here representing the youth tax teams of the Africa Youth Partnership. So um, the question I want to ask is, uh, we all know this year COP27 is happening in Africa and uh, in Egypt. So my question is, what should be Africa's stance 
in COP27, because we all know COP27 is dubbed as the African COP. And we all know how Africa is affected in terms of climate change, even though we contribute the least uh, when it comes to the global um, emission rates. So what should be Africans, Africa's stance in terms of um, ameliorating climate uh, change impacts, uh, especially leveraging the COP27 um, in Egypt? Thank you so much for the question. So I am going to my panelists. The first question was from my left. And the gentleman was asking about how best we can create a platform for young people uh, and making sure that no youth is left behind as we are trying to address the effects of climate change. And then the second question was addressed to Pater Rankin. And uh, I think the young lady wanted to understand how you can influence change through the platforms that you have that most people do not have access to. And then the third question came from the gentleman and he is asking about what should be the position of Africa as we are heading to COP27. Shall I start? Thank you. These three questions are pointing at one main problem, which is the, the fact that voices and knowledge and experiences that you all uh, go through in your daily lives need an outlet, need a platform, need a mechanism to make these voices heard and to turn these voices into actionable measures and actionable decisions. Now, one principle that I would like to offer without obviously uh, uh, sounding too pretentious, but if we spend a fraction of the time that we spend internationally, if we spend a fraction of the time that we spend in denying the effects of climate change and we spend them into understanding that climate change is with us, is impacting the daily lives of people and require urgent action, I think we would progress a lot towards finding viable solutions for the future. The problem is that we are still trapped in a denial sort of syndrome that is not very conducive to decision makers. In fact, they provide alibis to decision makers, excuses to postpone drastic decisions. So I would say give voice to science, give voice to evidence, and argue for that evidence to come in, you know, as a frontal piece of your decisions and your suggestions as youth who are in charge of your own future. Second, do not, or let's say, try to avoid a situation where decisions made today will lock you in for the next half a century in unviable solutions. How that, again, science, technology, creative financial solutions, starting from Africa, will unlock new ways of working and new ways of tackling either uh, solutions for mitigating climate change or solutions for adapting to inevitable consequences of climate change. So these are two tips that I can give you, but over to the others. Um, thank you very much for the great questions. Uh, I'll take on the last question, number three, the one that was asking what should be the position of Africa at COP27. Um, so I'll, I keep going back to finance um, because quite frankly, we can spend, I mean, we have been, spe we spent a lot of years arguing on who should be paying for the damages, you know, the voices, obviously, there's a lot of conversations that have been going on, but, um, you know, the rate at which we're mobilizing the finance to address these issues, whether it's the, you know, um, adapting to, 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 to our climate change, whether it's for agriculture sector, um, you know, the rate at which we're mobilizing finance is not sufficient, you know. Um, so for me, I think uh, as, as Africa, we, we really need to think of innovative ways 
to mobilize finance. Um, we also have to move away from, I mean, there's only so much out there that the Western or the developed world is going to give us. So one area I think that we need to tap into is the carbon markets. Um, you know, Africa has some of the biggest, uh, you know, landscapes, restoration and parks. I think that if we went uh, as, you know, with one voice as African nations really to get the carbon markets issues right, the carbon pricing, it would position us um, you know, better to actually be able to go out there and trade and mobilize the finance needed to address the issues we're facing. So for me, uh, I think that's the what. One area, uh, I think, as you know, under the negotiators, the African group of negotiators, I would really hope that um, this is something that is taken up um, you know, under Article 6. You know, there's still discussions around that, how, how, how are we going to trade, whether it's through the regulatory or the voluntary, but this is an untapped area for Africa that I believe uh, would also be sustainable. So we move away from always asking and begging for money. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teddy. I have heard we are running a little behind time. Um, so I'll ask Pato Ranking to respond to the question. Then after that, we can give our parting remarks, if that's OK. Uh, thank you. Um, so I remember before I started my, the first question I was asked, I said, if you're trying to look at somebody that is coming from struggle, what it, what it feels like coming from wages to wealth, you should look at me. You know, um, before I became um, Pateranki, you know, before I, the word we use in Nigeria, before I blew. Nigerians, are my Nigerian people here? Okay. So before I had a name, I, I remember I used to pray to God. I said, God, if you put me in a position of making money, I want to touch lives. You know, I want to be of help to people, and I want to be, I want to give hope to the hopeless. And who are these people? These people are people from my community, from the ghetto. I'm from the ghetto. And ever since then, in my own little corner, um, we've been doing a lot. You know, big shout out to my team. Um, we share the same vision. Uh, We've, we, we, are, we are heavily invested in education. I didn't go to a university, and I said to myself, if I have to make every African child get a university education, if I'm in that position, I would do that. And something remarkable happened last, <laughs> something, something remarkable happened the last time we came to Youth Connect. Big shout out to Mr. Fred. Um, the Pateranking Foundation was able to give 10 um, African kids from nine African countries full-blown scholarship, university scholarship. And also in Nigeria, we have um, about 165 kids ranging from primary to secondary to, you know, university that we support as well. So. The music for me is my platform. I have at least over I have about 20 million people across our board following me, and that is my platform. But there's a little to what I can do with that, you know, which is why the government support is very needed. I remember sitting with one government official in Nigeria. I told him, I said, um, the government is not a problem. He was shocked. He said, why? I said, yes, because even the Bible says, respect the laws of the land. If we are to start this world afresh, there will be a government in place to create those laws. The problem is the style of governance. They need to understand that things are changing. We've moved from analog to digital. You know, when I was coming here this morning, I told my friend, I said, um, they said I should be here by eight. He was laughing. He said, are you wearing the dark shades? I said, yes. He said, don't go there and sleep. Because it was too early for me. You know, we musicians, we go to bed like maybe 5 a.m. because you might be recording. And really and truly, I was recording yesterday. And he made a joke out of it by saying, don't sleep. And I saw it from a positive angle. Most of the people that, 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 that we 
that were supposed to represent us or most of the people representing us on the forefront, you know, of the continent, you see them in gatherings where they're supposed to speak for us. They are sleeping. So if you see me sleeping, it was something that was passed on. So, but because we don't want to pass this same problem to the next generation coming, we have to take something serious. That's why me, I feel my platform is very important to share the little idea I know about climate change and sustainability, you know, which is what I'm doing. Um, the UNDP is doing a great job. Um, we're family, but we like to make the conversation bigger. Um, uh, in my own musical terms, big up all the climate activists. You're doing a good job. Um, I think we just need to create more awareness, and which is what we're doing. Um, I would also love to indulge my colleague, fellow artists across the continent. Um, let's take it serious. Climate change is not only when you see it on CNN adverts, you know, um, it's, it's, it's real. Thank you. Whilst, whilst you still have the mic, uh, can you please, in 30 seconds, give us your parting remarks? In 30 seconds, if you still have any. Um, I don't know what to say. Um, what do you want Anything. me to say? <laughs> this gathering is, um, is making me feel some type of way, you know. One thing that has helped me as an artist is the fact that, not just an artist, as an individual, is um, I'm open to learning, you know, and I've, it's an opportunity to learn from my fellow panelists. I've been putting some points here. So tomorrow, when you hear a track titled Climate Change, get ready to dance to problems and solutions. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Um, so uh, I want to quote uh, Madme. He says, the future depends on what you do in the present. And so we have to start doing something now. And the way to get started is that we have to stop talking and start doing and believe that anything that you want you can achieve it happened for me thank you uh, just a few cl closing remarks or recommendations um, so I'm really glad that more people are joining in so I want to seize this opportunity to address to um, incubators uh, startups uh, many businessmen and women who are really thinking to build a sustainable green economy, uh, please do consider uh, our ancestral knowledge. So you, sir, talked about science and technology, but here's the thing. Science and technology, we could be built like a reconciliation between science, technology, and our ancestral knowledge. Sometimes solutions are in the past. So please dig deeper in the, into the past, get inspired from our ancestral knowledge of Africa, and we can really build and innovate. Um, the second uh, message, and I'm really glad that I'm surrounded by African youth, so please take a step forward. So you have to, um, I mean, we need to reclaim our earth, reclaim our mother nature. And also, um, I'm here, um, I'm responding to our friend uh, there. So he, was, he wanted to know how we can really um, strengthen our um, youth cooperation. So actually, what I have in mind is to really boost our South-South cooperation. I mean, we are African countries. We are most affected by climate change. But also, and most importantly, we have a shared history of colonization, of oppression. So I think we can really come together and to build resilience. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Again, it's been a pleasure to be on this panel. Um, for me, um, it's really anything small or any contribution is, is useful. So um, we all have a role to play uh, in this battle against cl climate change. 
And I know sometimes it can be, you know, sort of draining or even uh, uh, we, we feel like we're not moving at the pace we should be moving. Uh, but I really want to strongly encourage the youth that whether you're that entrepreneur who has trying to come up with a, a solution or, uh, you know, a smart idea, just keep, keep fighting and uh, I'm sure something will come in the end. So really, if we have to be a resilient youth and we are a resilient Africa, uh, it's important that we don't lose hope. It's, uh, the future is in our hands. Thank you. One last word from me. Our organization is ready to support as we have supported this event. And we will continue to be there next to you to support you in the next steps of your uh, travel, of your journey. So please uh, rely on us and we will be by your side. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Another round of applause to our amazing panelists. Don't forget that Pato Ranking said, don't sleep. Don't sleep on duty.